different types of columns that we run into, steel, lolly columns. The reason why you put the rubber membranes, and not everybody does this, but the reason why it's there is because of the moisture and the salts that are in there, we don't want to let the uh, that humidity and moisture, that, that stuff that's in there, we don't want to let that get to the steel and cause it to rot out. On top of it, you're going to see most of the time, sorry about that, on the top of these, you're going to, most of the time we're going to see bolts on there. And like I said, I find them loose all the time. Um, once or twice I see where they have the straps where they just fold them over. Okay. And I don't think I've ever seen one where it was actually welded in place where it comes to it. So our most common process is going to be these nuts and bolts on here. Should be true. Uh, plumb straight up and down. And these are usually four inch columns, sometimes three inch columns. So one inch would be our maximum lean, but, but truthfully, these should never be leaning at all. All right. And these are the bolts that I was talking about. And these actually look pretty snug coming in here. But um, I, I tell you this much, I have seen when they get delivered, sometimes the delivery guys will just throw them into the basement. And I've seen where these things have been bent. And I'm not too sure, you know, you see a line right up over there. I've seen where they've gotten bent, and then when you put the bolts into place, that lifts it back up there. And when we're dealing with steel, um, you can only bend it one time. It'll bend down, but once you bend it back up again, then it's gonna snap or crack. Um, you wanna eyeball that, all right? We do have to have a certain distance. Uh, this is a continuous beam with the posts in the middle. So I have to have at least four inches. So if that lolly column is four inches, we're good. If it's three inches, we know we got at least some on some side of it. Um, but yeah, it's not smaller than that. But we have to have at least four inches. If there was a seam on this thing, then I would need three inches on each side for a total of six inches going over the whole thing. Here's another post where it was bent up and over just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so temporary post and permanent post. I would like to talk about these. Um, there are adjustable columns that are permanent, all right? They are screw jacks that come in there. Those are just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the temporary ones are the ones that have holes in them and they're adjustable for different heights. We can't use those for permanent installations. Or at least they're not supposed to be using. And again, if I see them, we're going to call them out. Again, don't let somebody else's problem become your problem, plain and simple. All right. So these here, oops, I jumped over too much. So these are the holes that I'm talking about. These are temporary posts that comes in there. Now this house did have a lot of termite damage into it. The termite was also into the beam up in here. Somebody tried to do some repairs and they sandwiched that beam with two by 12s. They were trying to lift everything back up in here. Um, and then they ran out of money and the home ended up getting foreclosed on. So now this is something else that somebody else wants to take over and purchase. And what is it that you need to do? You know, so we know we need to get some good posts in there. We know we need to have a good foundation or a footing underneath that post. We may be replacing some beams coming in here. I mean, every problem can be fixed. So the question is always going to be how much is it going to cost to get it fixed? And obviously who's going to pay for it, you know, to get it fixed. So knowing these things, is give, we're allowed to give good advice to our clients, plain and simple. Um, concrete, there's two types or two schools of thoughts on filling in these gaps with concrete. Um, one thought is I don't want to take a chance of that beam twisting or rotating. So I want to fill that in there with the mortar, the brick, the concrete, make sure that it's solid and it's not going to move. Um, the other school is, well, you're putting the concrete and water right where the steel or the wood is. And now you're going to create a pocket where you're going to hold all that water in there. Should it get in there and you're not going to know about it. Um, and that's going to cause that beam to rot out. Okay. And I can see an argument for both of them. All right. So I don't, and not only that, but I don't know what my bearing is on this. I don't know how far that beam goes in there. 
we do need to have three inches up there in that spot, which I can't confirm it. So, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to throw some disclaimers out there, but mostly I'm going to look and see if there's anything, if this is doing what it's doing. And truthfully, looking at what I'm seeing right here, there's no cracks, no signs of multiple repairs, no signs of rust in that steel I-beam. I'm actually comfortable. I would let my clients know about it, you know, but I don't think I would make uh, too much of an issue out of things whatsoever, all right? So, and again, that's my two cents. Um, I'm throwing my disclaimer out there right away. If you disagree with me, I, I fully respect you. There is no, you know, I'm not telling you what your opinion should be, but I'm just trying to give you things to think about, all right? So when we're talking about uh, floor trusses and and floor joists, I, I do want you to know the difference, all right? Uh, truss is going to be engineered. Um, we refer to that as lightweight construction. So up at the very top, this is a truss. Even this where it says wood eye, that is a truss, all right? Plywood, laminated veneers, those are also considered lightweight construction when we're dealing with stuff, even the parallel strand board. So everything here is engineered wood, all right? Um, open, uh, open floor trusses, and um, you'll find them. And as long as it's a basement, there's really not going to be too much of a deal with it. Now, when I'm dealing with trusses, I'd like to be a little on the anal retentive side, all right? These can't, at least the cords, um, or any open truss, and we're going to get to a slide that talks about modifying them, and we'll talk about it on roof as well. And the general rule of thumb is you just don't do it. You don't modify them in any which way, all right? However, I need you to know they are modifiable, all right? But, you know, for repairs or if somebody needs to remove a section of them and design them, you're going to need a structural engineer. I would prefer it be somebody from the trust manufacturing company, but there needs to be a piece of paper that's associated with this. And that should stay in the house and stay with the house because if I bought this house and it had a modification to the truss and now I want to go sell it, I would expect that home inspector to come out here, hey, somebody cut this truss, it's been modified, I don't know if this is good enough, now I'm going to get questions from my buyer, I need to have that document of paper saying, yes, it was cut, and here's the modification to this and what says that it's okay, all right? So no, some of the names that are on here, I'd like you to be familiar with it when we're dealing with floor, uh, floor trusses. The top piece going across is known as the top cord. The bottom piece going across is the bottom cord. All the pieces in the middle are web members that come in here. And again, a truss or floor joist, beams, every piece of lumber gets its strength when it's plumb, when it's straight up and down. Once I start allowing that load to turn over and twist, I'm really losing the strength of that truss. They are designed to be under tension and compression. So what I mean by that is this bottom cord will be under tension. This top cord will be under compression. When you're looking at these things, they're tedious. We want to look at every single gusset plate that's on here and all the connections are gusset plates that go in there. We want to make sure there's no notching, breaking, damaging, slipping. Look for the hammer, hammer heads on the pieces of steel. Yes, am I that anal retentive? The real question is yes. If they're damaged, they could be repaired. You can cover them up with wood gusset plates. There's some communities that don't even allow steel gusset plates in residential construction. Or if they do, it has to be a sprinklered home when they do any sort of lightweight construction, no matter how you do it. Um, in the town that I live in, if we put up any of those pieces of lumbers, LVLs, um, floor trusses, eye joists, uh, laminated beams, um, I already mentioned laminated veneer lumber, any of those in residential construction that's new today, I have to have a house or a fire sprinkling system installed as well. The only time they allow you to build a home in this town without a fire sprinkler is when everything is dimensional lumber, all right? And because I needed a couple of beams installed, my options were steel or, but they were, you know, or I had to go ahead and get some sort of a, what's called a flitch plate is what I ended up building on mine. So we had to put three pieces of steel because I only had seven and a half inches 
of opening to work with because it was a remodel, but we did keep some of the original structure. We didn't take everything down to the bare bones. And I only had seven and a half inches to work with. And in order to get the weight and the support loads from the, that I needed from the architect, you had three pieces of half inch steel that were 20 feet long sandwiched between four pieces of plywood, or not plywood, of two by eight lumber in there and we had a bolt high and low every 16 inches to secure that whole thing together. It, it took, I want to say like eight guys to get that thing and we took it up in pieces and assembled it and dropped it in, uh, in a hole. It was a nightmare, plain and simple, all right? So low bearing points as well is something to be aware of. When we're dealing with trusses and more specifically, like these are called trim trusses. Now these sections here, when you see the plywood, sorry about that. When you see the plywood in these areas here, these are designed to be cut, all right? You just can't go past this line right here. So when they sell the trusses, they don't know exactly how long they're gonna need. So these are, these are the type you would buy at the the Home Depots, the Menards, or the Lowe's, the, the major supply stores, they'll have them in stock on site. Um, no, not always, but you know, so they'll have them there and you can just buy a section of these things and then you would trim them to get them to fit exactly where you want. But you can't go past this mark here. So these are all the different gusset plates that I was working on. Now this is the eye joist part here. This is not designed for any sort of structural support whatsoever. If this is plywood on the outside here, and it looks like it is, all right, then I would have to have squash blocks or something to take um, supports in here. So they would put two by fours up and down on each side of these floor joists in here to make it solid um, because the plywood isn't designed to, to carry the weight of the, the walls and the structure, and that's whenever there's a pinch point. So I got load bearing below, I got load bearing above, that's my pinch point, and so I need to have some sort of two by fours. I'll show pictures of that in a little bit. All right. All right, here's our trusses. No cutting, no notching, nothing else, but again, we can do it if we have a structural engineer or an architect, somebody with that PE stamp that designs it and the plan should be there. They're the ones that can say it's okay. All right, TJI, um, that stands for Trust Joist Industries. They are the manufacturer of this product here that we're looking at called Silent Floors. Um, they also make uh, laminated uh, boards that go around the outside as well for those squash blocks that I was talking about. Uh, they're, they're trusses, all right? They have a top cord and they have a bottom cord and all this wood in the middle is the web of everything else. So instead of just using two by fours for the web, we're gonna have solid pieces of wood in there, all right? Here we're showing them being used for um, rafters, and that's fine. Long distances, they can do all that as long as they live into the weights. We can't cut the top cord. We can't cut the bottom cord, all right? So they do have special brackets on here that allow you to get that angle that you need so you don't have to notch this. If I notch it, um, there are repairs for it. Don't get me wrong. It's not the end of the world if somebody does cut it but we're not supposed to, all right? And you're gonna find a, a bunch of slides here and I'll probably end up zipping through these things as, as the later ones go through. It's common, it's a habit. Like people don't, don't respect the trusses and I need to get my bathtub drain in this situation. I need to get it right there. So I need to get that top cord of that floor joist. You never should have put your floor joist where my plumbing needs to go. Um, reminds me of Cool Hand Luke and moving dirt. But nonetheless, they cut it. This doesn't mean it's the end of the world. They do have repairs for these sort of things. Um, if you go to the Trust Joist Industries website, you can actually find their detailed drawings. This isn't where we have to hire an architect or uh, where we have to hire an architect or a structural engineer to go ahead and create the drawings because they've already been created, all right? So these type of repairs happen or these damages happen and the repairs are common and you can go ahead and look up those details um, through any of the 
manufacturers of the eye joist, all right? Same thing here, they drilled through the, the top cord just to get the electric through it. Here they notched it to get the plumbing pipes through it. It happens, all right? Um, proper joist hangers are also kind of a, a big thing. And these I just don't recognize. So if I don't know something, I'm gonna say I don't know, but it's not the typical joist hangers that I see. However, um, I would like you to recognize this piece of wood that's stuffed in here. So back in here in the upper right corner is the original plywood of the eye joist. But notice now where the bottom cord, and you can see it pretty well on the top cord, that's all flush, all right? So now instead of the shape of the letter I, we now made a rectangle out of that. That's called a web stiffener. Those two pieces of, in this case it's OSB, and it's made by uh, TJI or the Sinophore Systems to fit right in there, all right? We fill that and we make that section a rectangle, so that's the same as having a squash block in this area. If I had to tie my... Uh, if I had to tie my um, joist hanger into another eye joist, I would, that would have to be a rectangle as well. But in this case, I'm using one of their um, inch and a half or three inch boards uh, for their structural support or their rim joist boards is what it is. And they make those at the same height as whatever the TJIs are. So then you can use these going around the outside and we don't have to have squash blocks now on exterior walls because this is what's going to be supporting the weight when it comes to it. Another view, I like this one a little bit better. This is the web stiffener in here and even up in this one here, that's also a web stiffener. So here's my eye joist. I'm going to take this eye joist and go right into it because of which I need to have a web stiffener behind it, make a rectangle out of this and then same thing coming across here.